So, President, Provost, dear friends and dear colleagues, it's such a great pleasure for me to be here today and to share some of my recent ideas and thoughts that I have been developing in my historical work here at Aalto University. Uh, the title of my talk today is Remaking as a Methodology in Textile and Fashion History. Okay, in 1520, which is exactly 500 years ago, a young German accountant whose name was Matthäus Schwarz initiated an extraordinary project. He commissioned 137 watercolor illustrations that showed how he looked like in different stages of his life, up until he was 63 years old. In the colorful pages of this manuscript, this young, fascinating man shows himself dressed in different kinds of outfits in front and back. What is really remarkable about this book of fashion is not only that this man was so interested in changing fashions 500 years ago, but it was also how he experienced his own body. When he was young, he recorded his waist measures in the book. He was very skinny, just 60 centimeters waist measure. But as he got older, he got in increasingly worried about putting on weight. So he decided to commission some nude images of himself. And, um, and um, next to one of these images, he recorded a little message saying, that was my real figure from behind because I had become fat and large. The interest in this period in clothing and fashion was not limited to visual sources, but it extended to the everyday life of Italians and Europeans. Archival documents that we have been studying for many years show that European families, especially the wealthy families, spent a considerable amount of money in clothing. Some families could spend as much up to 40% of their total household wealth on fashion. And this fashion context then inspired some remarkable inventions on the market. And one example, for example, is this women's platform shoe that we see on the left image, which I got to hold in one of the museums. Um, and this remarkable shoe grew so high in the course of the 15th and 16th century that it was recorded at some point being over 30 centimeters high. This great interest in fashion in this period made clothing significant. Clothing was not just beautiful to look at, but it tells us also something very important about the social and cultural ideas and attitudes and values of the time. Fashion, however, is not just a matter of aesthetic appreciation or social meaning. But it was also very important how clothing was made, and especially what materials were used to make garments. It was very important, for example, what color the garment was, because many dye stuffs were extremely valuable, extremely costly. The importance that was attached to color, and also to the processes of obtaining very beautiful colors, becomes visible in the increasing production in the 16th century of printed dye recipes, which gave instruction to dyers and, and people at home how to achieve beautiful colors. One of the earliest examples is the Plicto, which was published in Venice already in 1548 by a man named Joan Ventura Rossetti. His manual gave instructions, among other recipes, for 35 different kinds of reds and 21 very beautiful blacks. The attention on materiality in this period kind of implies that, materiality, that the material and the very materiality of fashion was a crucial factor in the experience of how people dressed and how they experienced dress. 
But the problem for us historians is that there are not that many surviving historical textiles. And those that have survived up to our day are mostly in a very poor condition or then very heavily restored. So it's very difficult to understand what the colors or materials originally were, or what did actually these materials look like or how they were made. In my current research project, which is called the Refashioning the Renaissance, I and my team members are trying to make um, or develop new ways how we could access this materiality that most, mostly doesn't exist anymore. And we are doing this by engaging with remaking and reconstruction. This means that in addition to uh, reading books in libraries or going to the archives, which we still do. Uh, but in addition to doing this historical research, we also make things by hand. Um, particularly, it means that we want to restore and, and reconstruct some of the items that we find our documentary sources. We also spend time in labs testing how 16th century recipes could be used in historical work. We also engage with science uh, to kind of try to understand how we could use various scientific methods, such as DNA or fiber analysis, in our historical work. To illustrate what this means particularly and in more detail, I would like to introduce you one of our reconstruction projects. This is a reconstruction of a 17th century doublet, which is essentially kind of a jacket, uh, a male doublet, which belonged in the 17th century to a modest water seller who lived in Florence and died there in 1631. We are very interested in this particular garment because it represents a fantastic imitation piece. It belongs to a very ordinary man. He's not a member of the elite. He's an ordinary artisan uh, type of person who doesn't have very much money at all, but he wants to appear as, as fashionable as he can be. So his doublet is made of black stamped woolen velvet, which was called mocayado. And, um, and this kind of material was made probably quite skillfully to imitate something more expensive, which was kind of patter patterned silk velvet fabric. We know that this water seller had the doublet because it's recorded in his personal um, list of clothing, and we can see the description up here. But that's all we know about the garment. We don't know what it looked like. We don't know how it was made. And we don't actually know what this mocayado fabric was. So which, with such little information, how can we then try to reconstruct this garment? We first began our reconstruction by putting together a lot of visual sources. We wanted to understand uh, what doublets in 1620s, 1630s, in Florence might have looked like. And based on our work, uh, we noticed that most doublets were probably made uh, with detachable sleeves. So they were originally sleeveless. So they could have looked something like this relatively simple doublet in the middle image. The second task for us was then to try to work out what this mocayada fabric was. We spent quite a lot of time in museums for example, in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, studying some surviving 17th century, century woolen velvet pieces so that we could understand the character and structure of these fabrics. And here on the left, you can see one of our team members, Sophie Pittman, who is, who is leading this project in our work. We were then very lucky to discover that the London School of Historic Dress actually had a surviving uh, piece of uh, 17th century black stamped woolen velvet. So we traveled to London and went to the School of Historical Dress 
and we got a permission to take some physical samples of the fabric so that we could carry out scientific testing. So we then carried out a fiber and dye analysis for those little samples of the surviving fabric to get some more accurate information about, about the types of yarns that were used to weave this fabric, create the pile and create the ground weave, as well as um, about the dye, the coloring sources that were used for the black dye. We, were very, we are very interested in um, seeing, um, of course, the fi final product. And um, because we are not craftspeople, we are working together with a lot of craft professionals. With the information that we have got from our research, we are now able to start sourcing together materials for the doublet. Our yarn will be spun in the UK. The Mokayado fabric will be done using traditional looms, either in Genova or in the UK. Our fabric will be dyed using traditional methods in Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And the stamp will be uh, commissioned from UK. And because we want this tablet to look professional and beautiful, we also commissioned the actual garment from the London School of Historic Dress, who are very professional in historical tailoring and pattern making, as well as decorating the garments. This process is very interesting for us because it will make visible something that is invisible in our data. So this research brings somehow this garment in life. But what we are also very interested in is not just touching and, and seeing the garment, but we are also very interested in understanding the process of, of how it was originally created. And this is why um, I and our, our team members have participated in many different craft courses and worked together with, with people who are producing still uh, crafts in traditional ways to understand all stages of production uh, that was involved with making such a doublet. So here you can see some of these images of some of the courses that, that we have taken. So we have, for example, taken um, fiber preparation course in Italy and in Sweden to understand how fibers were traditionally prepared. I have here, for example, some silk that we have made from cocoons in Italy in very traditional ways. And you can see a picture here of reeling silk in a very simple and traditional way. We also took a weaving course in Fondazione Lisio in Florence to understand how woolen velvets and velvets in this period were woven. And, um, and we also studied historical te textile technologies there. So we have now some beautiful samples from that that uh, weaving experience, and, and these have been woven on a traditional loom. Um, and we also did a little course for in London School of History Dress to, to actually sew up a little sample um, um, of, or a little version example of a doublet. And, and this is a little half of a doublet that I have, a um, mini doublet that I have sewn at the London School of Historic Dress. It's not professionally uh, sewn, but it nonetheless gives a very good understanding and idea for me and, and others who look at it, how this complex garment was created. It's, it's actually a very complicated uh, garment to sew. Some of us also participated in black dye courses, which were organized in, in Belgium and in the Netherlands, uh, to test different 16th century recipes for black. And here's one example, and black was, black was actually the most difficult color to obtain in this period, because, because this kind of deep, saturated black color was difficult to achieve, but also it was difficult to make a black that would be uh, resistant for, for weather and, um, and light. So now, after all this weaving, uh, fiber preparation and dyeing, which we have enjoyed very much, <laughs> we are faced with a very serious question. Is remaking in history just a lot of fun? Or can it be developed as a serious and valid methodology in cultural history of dress? 
I hope that by the end of our project, our, me and my team members are able to demonstrate that remaking and historical reconstruction is not just a really convenient way to access materials and processes that no longer exist, but we also want to demonstrate that, that this is a very new and dynamic way to, um, to read the past. And although we have uh, still a lot of challenges that we need to deal with, for example, that, that reconstruction is not the authentic and it's not trying to be the authentic, we nonetheless argue that this method brings something new and dynamic and, and some kind of information, new information that doesn't exist in any book, any visual, any archival record. And, um, and therefore, it builds in our knowledge in how clothing was and materials were experienced in this period. Thank you very much.